Now, praise the Lord once again. Welcome to the Spirit of Truth. And we're talking about the Day of Atonement. This is lesson, the highlights of the Lesson 15. If you would like to have this Bible study taught in your church or Bible study group, if you would like to have the 2 by 4 for charts, uh, the visual uh, illustration of the tabernacle with Bible study lessons, you give me a call, area code 865-200-1805. I'll send it right out to you, and uh, we do. I don't follow up. I don't call people. I don't charge people. We don't charge anybody for anything here. But the gospel says, freely do I offer and freely do I give. Now, let me tell you this. When God's called me, he separated me from this world. He said, read the book of Numbers. I called Israel out from Egyptian slavery. Uh, and I'm calling you out of, out of the world slavery of sin. And he told me the same thing he told his people Israel. Don't go down. Don't go back in Egypt for help. Don't go down to the world, he said to me. He said, don't go down the world for help. I'm your God. I'm a jealous God. I'll take care of you. Okay? That's why we can call this program the Spirit of Truth. Because we can preach the Spirit of Truth. And don't have to worry about who's going to pay the light bill. God pays my light bill. Okay, praise the Lord. Now we're talking about the Day of Atonement. It's found in Leviticus chapter 16, and uh, verse 2 says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron your brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, that would be the Holy of Holies, within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will, for I will appear in the cloud, that would be the Shekinah glory, Upon the mercy seat. Now, you can also read in uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. The only place where the Day of Atonement is recorded, with the exception of a couple of other scriptures in the Bible that talk about the sacrifices, the only place that you can read what took place on the Day of Atonement is in Leviticus chapter 16. So, I suggest you read that chapter about 10 or 15 times. Okay, the high priest, we're talking about Aaron. The high priest Aaron sanctified himself by taking a bath. Now, uh, all other times, daily, the, high, the priests, all the priests, they, they washed from the laver in the outer courts. They, they um, took from the top of the laver to wash, and they rinsed and cleansed from the bottom of the laver. Okay? Now... Uh, but on the Day of Atonement, they took a complete bath. And the high priest took, took a complete bath, and he, and, he, and he put on the pure white holy linen garments. Now, we talked about in the holy place a few weeks ago that he put on the breeches, the girdle. He put on the coat. He put on the robe of the ephod, the blue robe. He put on the... Uh, uh, ephod, which is, the, the, uh, which is blue, purple, and scarlet. He put on the curious girdle, blue, purple, and scarlet. He put on the breastplate um, and all the colored garments, you know, the, the robe, it had the bells and palm granites and everything. He never put this on on the Day of Atonement. He never wore this in the Day of Atonement. What he wore on the Day of Atonement is described in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 4. The only place it is described. He put on the pure white breeches. These breeches were from above the waist to down below the, kneeca the, uh, the kneecaps. In addition, he put the pure white holy linen girdle. They were attached to the breeches. They held the breeches in place. He put on the pure white linen coat and he put on the mitre. This is the only garments that Aaron had on the Day of Atonement. The breeches speak of God's uh, perfect provision in Christ. The white girdle speaks of his service. The white coat speaks of his righteousness and spotless purity of Christ. And then the mitre speaks of the authority of Christ. These are the garments he had on the Day of Atonement. He went out into the holy 
excuse me, he went out into the outer courts. He took live coals of fire from off that altar because God lit that fire. Salvation is of man, it's not of God. Uh, excuse me, salvation is of God, it's not of man. Let me say it again. Salvation is of God, not of man. If you remember, the, the scripture says in Leviticus chapter 9, it says, There came a fire out from before the Lord. When all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. And then it says, it's in verse 6 and verse 9, it says, uh, it says, when God lit his fire, that fire never went out. And that's a type of Christ because Jesus keeps that fire lit right now, today, while, 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 as, I, as we speak, okay? Now, he took live coals of fire. This is the same fire that, that they kept alive as they moved from place to place. They kept, uh, somebody said, well, how did that fire burn all that time? Because they kept the live coal and they carried that live coal from place to place everywhere they went. They kept it burning. Uh, Jesus keeps the call to salvation burning constantly, 24 hours a day, who, to all who will repent and receive him. Okay, he went in and took this uh, live coal, and he put it in a golden censer. He took the golden censer within the veil, and he sprinkled uh, uh, incense on it, and this caused a cloud of smoke to billow up and cover the mercy seat, and the, and the smoke separated him from the ark that he died not. Can't look at the, uh, no man has seen God at any time. Okay, if he did, he did. He had Aaron in front of the ark, in front of Aaron there was a cloud, a cloud of smoke, and behind that cloud of smoke was the ark and mercy seat and cherubim. So he sprinkled this, uh, he went out into the, he backed out of the, uh, of the Holy of Holies through the veil, and he took the blood of the bullock in a basin, and he went in there and he, in the Holy of Holies, and he, he, he stood before the mercy seat, and he sprinkled through the cloud of incense blood with his finger, the Bible says, seven times uh, upon and before the mercy seat. Okay? He sprinkled his blood before the mercy seat and then on the mercy seat seven times for a sin offering for himself and for his household for an atonement. In verse 3, 6, 11, and 14. And then he backed out and he brought in the blood of the, of, of the goat in a basin. And he did the same thing. He stood before the mercy seat and ark and he sprinkled the blood before and through the cloud upon the mercy seat seven times for a sin offering for the nation of Israel for, to make an atonement. Okay, I've got it clear so far now. On the day of atonement, the high priest, dressed only in his pure white holy linen garments, typifying the holiness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, entered through the veil into the Holy of Holies, with the blood of the sin offering, he made an atonement for the sins of the nation of Israel. When the blood of the sin offering was sprinkled on the mercy seat, it covered the law. Okay, you remember the law, the commandments were in the ark. The mercy seat was on the uh, ark, and then the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. And when God saw the blood upon his law, which was beneath the mercy seat in the ark, he descended the Holy of Holies and appeared behind the cloud of smoke from the burning incense on the live coals of fire on the mercy seat between the two cherubim, which were above the ark, in the form of his Shekinah glory. Okay, so what he did was, when he saw, yeah, let's get this right. We got to get it right because because you know things about the Bible, and typology is going to seep up in your soul. Okay, and, and the Lord is going to show you more probably than what I'm telling you here. Uh, like I said, this is not new. This is uh, this is uh, just a deeper understanding and a deeper revelation of of what you already know. Okay, so here Aaron is. He had already sprinkled the incense. 
to protect him from from uh, the Shekinah glory, God. And then he had sprinkled the blood of the bullock, made an atonement for uh, himself and, and, and his family. And then he, he sprinkled the blood of the goats for atonement before uh, the mercy seat seven times before and seven times on like he did with the bullock. Now, and when God saw the blood on that mercy seat, he did not see his law. And that's when he entered in upon the mercy seat between the two cherubims above the ark in his Shekinah glory, the form of the Shekinah glory. Okay. Now, Jesus made an atonement for our souls. Leviticus uh, 17, 11 and Matthew 26, 28. This is a type of Christ because Jesus fulfilled the, the law, uh, the whole law. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, in Matthew five seventeen. And it, it was not just the Ten Commandments either. It was the, law, the whole law, uh, the health laws, everything. So our sins, when we look at Jesus Christ through his blood sacrifice, our sins have been forgiven. When God looks upon our heart, he sees us under the precious blood of Christ, Revelation 1, 5, and 6. He doesn't look directly upon us, because if he did, he'd have to kill us, okay? Uh, but he, he sees us through the blood. The world that does not save, uh, that is not saved, the people that are not under the blood of Jesus, they're dead. They're just walking dead people. Okay, they're dead in spirit. So the presence of God dwells now in us through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 through 16, 1 John 4, 13, chapter 3, verse 24, Psalms 104, and Hebrews 1, 7. Jesus is the Shekinah glory. And we saw this very clear, I think, last week in... Uh, in John 17, verse 1 through 26, when he said, Father, glorify thou me with uh, the same glory I had with you before the world was. If that's not the Shekinah glory, and if that's not equality with God, I don't know what is. So the presence of God dwells in us now through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he sprinkled the rest. Now notice what he does on the Day of Atonement. He sprinkled the rest of the, the blood of the bullock and of the goat round about and upon the horns of the uh, uh, on the altar of incense seven times to cleanse it and made it made an atonement for it. He backed out through the veil into the holy uh, place and he sprinkled the blood of the bullock and the goat on the horns of the golden altar in the uh, um, the holy place in Exodus chapter 30 verse 8 through 10 in Leviticus chapter 4 3 through 7 and then verse 18 and 19 so he made an atonement now for the holy of holies and he made an atonement for the holy place Leviticus 16 18 and 19 the sins of the nation of Israel Israel, 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 Israel now, let me back up here. It's very important. The reason why he sprinkled the blood on the uh, golden altar into in the uh, holy place is to get the sin out of the, uh, out of the church. Get it out. God needs to get the sin out of the church. That's what he needs to do. How much sin is in the sanctuaries? Get the sin out of there. I'll give you a light example. You walk in these cemetery uh, cemetery. You walk in these uh, sanctuaries now, in these churches, in the main uh, worship area, and they're talking about football, they're talking about everything, talking about politics. This is not a place for this junk, okay? If you're a preacher, preaching politics, you need to find another church. We're supposed to be preaching about Jesus, okay? Especially in the main sanctuary. They talk about everything. I mean, if, if you got something to say, shut up and get up to the altar and pray or something. Be quiet. Have respect for the house of the Lord. And that's putting it light when I say get the sin out of the camp, out of the church. Get the sin 
out of the church because the tabernacle says in Acts 7, 38, is it? It says the tabernacle was the church in the wilderness. You see how they conducted the worship in the, in the holy place, but we're supposed to follow that procedure. Would we say the candlestick and the table of showbread and, uh, and the golden altar is what? Eat, pray, shine is what we're supposed to be doing in the church. Now, uh, he sprinkled the blood on the horns of the altar. The sins of the nation of Israel were transferred. Now, he went outside. Remember now, he's still in this pure white holy linen garments. He went out in the outer court. There had been two goats that was uh, chosen, and cast, lots were cast on one of the goats to be a scapegoat and one of the goats to be an atonement. Okay, we already saw the, the blood of the, the goat that made the atonement. That's gone. That's passed. Now he goes out in the outer court. He takes the other goat, and what does he do? Puts his hands on the head of the goat. He transfers the sins of the nation of Israel on the head of this live goat. And then he calls for a righteous man to take this goat so far out from the tabernacle that it would never find its way back. He would let it go, and the goat would die in the wilderness. You know, <laughs> again, he, he wants us to get the sin out of the camp. I'm, what's so hard about that? What is so hard about that? Getting the sin out of the, of the sanctuary. Uh, this goat, you know, I often wondered that, that uh, when this goat was taken out there, and, and this is just a thought, that when that goat died, where would all them demons in that goat go? Evil spirits, where'd they go? Is that why the Middle East is so crazy over there? Okay, that's just my thought. I don't, I, I'm just telling you what I thought. Maybe I shouldn't have said it, but that was just a thought across my mind. But now, Jesus is our scapegoat because all the sins were taken away when he died on the cross. That's why that term scapegoat comes into being. See, they had a real scapegoat in the Old Testament. Now we have the true real scapegoat in Jesus Christ because he took our sins away. He sure did. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Romans 6, 10, Hebrews 7, 27, chapter 9, verse 12, verse 28, chapter 10, verse 10, 1 Peter 3, 18. Jesus has taken away all our sins with his own blood, Hebrews 10, 17. Something, isn't it? How the, how it's so picture, picturesque. How it's so visual. How, how it's so easy to understand. And this is just a highlight. That's why I say you need to you need this Bible study in your church. Uh, if they won't have it in the church. Have it in your house. That's all. You you got to hear this word. Okay, this word's going forward. And then the high priest took a bath. And then he put on the seven-piece garments of glory and beauty, and he made the final offering. This is in verse 24. Okay, now, now uh, uh, all we have to do is believe the Word of God, and you're going to have, through your knowledge uh, and through your, your uh, revelation, you're going to have a lot to add to this because uh, I'm just touching on the highlights of this, okay? So... Be it assured of one thing, he only had the pure white holy linen garments. He didn't change back till after the scapegoat. So, when we talk about the Passover, you know, Easter's coming, so let's, let, let's, let's look at this now. When Jesus, the innocent one, died, innocent one, died for our sins, the guilty on the cross of Calvary, for our sins, God rent that veil. Remember the veil? He rent it in two from top to bottom. That ended the priesthood. Ended it. It's over. We no longer need 
a high priest to represent us before God. Now we have Jesus Christ to represent us. And he says that we can go right in to the presence of God through his flesh, through his blood. Anytime we're led or we feel the need to. We no longer need that priest. It's just amazing, isn't it? Jesus, when he died, he resurrected and he ascended into heaven. And we need to understand, again, study the word. Open the Bible studies in the church. When Jesus died, he gave us forgiveness of sins. When he resurrected, he gave us eternal life, didn't he? And when he ascended, he gave us power to live for him because he sent back the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to do here, i got a few minutes left. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about garment, uh, the garments for Aaron's sons, the ministering priest. Uh, they, they had their garments. They wore the coats. And the coats, their coats speak of... Uh, Salvation in Isaiah 61.10. Their girdles speak of service in Psalms 100, verse 2. Their breeches speak of self, and, and we're getting this serious stuff here. The breeches speak of self-effacement, humility, submission, obedience. And this is the number one or two, what other problem in the church? People today are, are, are not obedient. They're not in submission. They're not a humble people, by and large. Galatians 3, 1 through 3, chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, rather, and, and verse 22, 23. We are the priesthood of believers. We're supposed to be in submission, in obedience. And they wore bonnets. Bonnets speak of subjection. These were the garments of Aaron's sons, the priests. They didn't wear a mitre. They wore, they wore bonnets. The four garments are, and you notice they're all white. The breeches, the uh, inside girdle, the coat, and the mitre, pure white. And all, understand, all who receive forgiveness from sins through the blood of Christ and serve faithfully are a type of Aaron's sons, the priests. We are a type of, of them, vice versa. Think about it. They are the priesthood of believe, believers. We are the true today. We are the true. We are a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 through 9. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 10. And uh, chapter 20, verse 6. Okay. Now, these last 15 uh, weeks has been uh, just highlights. We're just t touching here and there on the magnificence in the plan of redemption uh, through typology. So, when this it, it is now, the highlights are over. So, from here on in, I'm going to come on the air and give you a full, in-depth uh, message in typology every week until it's done. And I'm doing this because this is what God called me to do. We have churches, uh, especially here in Knoxville, that they got problems, man. They don't want to study in. They don't like, they say I make them mad by the way I talk. Well, you know, what can I tell you? All right. I mean, we, we, in most of these churches, we're, they're serving a different Jesus. All right. I'm serving the same one that saved me years ago. And I'm going to say it plain, and I'm going to say it simple. And the reason why I do this, you can teach kids, young people in the church what you want to and how you want to teach it, but they see everything and they hear everything. And our, our kids know what's going on. I know because believe it or not, I was a kid at one time. I saw stuff in the church coming up. I said, man, these people are liars. They're, they're crazy. And kids remember. That's why I teach it plain pure and simple. I remember years ago, I go back, oh man, 35, 38 years ago when I first started out teaching in Knoxville off Kingston Pike on the radio, 
there was a Baptist guy that came down. He says, can I come down there in person and listen to the Bible study? I said, yeah, sure, come on down. And uh, you want to help, it's up to you, it, it, Whatever, the, whoever the Lord sends. So he came down there, and they ju we just introduced uh, Brother Joe and Bible study. He said, we got to have a name for the Bible study. I said, uh, okay, you got a name? <laughs> and he prayed about it for a long time, and about four or five weeks, and then he said, uh, the Lord gave me the name. And I said, and what is the name? He says, the spirit of truth, if you can bear it. If you can speak the truth plain and clear, if you can bear it, that's the name. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that man, uh, the Lord gave a powerful name. And I would have to say things just point blank, you know, and that's the way it is. If you're not saved, you're going to hell. America is going to be a third world country pretty soon. Uh, we're filled with sin. We're like Sodom and Gomorrah. The only way that I know how to say it is just to say it. So if you're not saved, you need to be saved. Get on your knees and ask the Lord to reveal himself to you. He will. Forget all the plans that people have. The main goal is to get saved. Stop sinning and serve Jesus. That's what it's all about. I'm out of time. If you want the tabernacle typology preached in your church or Bible study group, or if you want the information, give me a call. Area code 865-200-1805. So, Lord willing, we're going to see you again next week.